warn them that uh, they can also watch this webinar via Facebook, right? Well, I have people already from Sao Paulo, Santo André. Hello, everybody. It's Paraíba. Wow, that's very, very nice. Rio, Americana, Piracicaba, Porto Alegre. Wow, gee, I'm so happy to have all of you here. It's really, really amazing. Thank you very, very much for your uh, uh, for your participation. We have even people from Cuiabá, Bahia, well, Valinhos, well, all, all different places in this country. That's very, very nice indeed. Okay, so I'm gonna start by saying that I will share with you my screen. And because of that, I won't be able to uh, read your messages, but um, what I am going to do is uh, suppose that you will be able to hear me. If you have any problems during the transmission, you can switch to Facebook, right? Uh, Enrique and Lirica from Giselle, they are also uh, attending the session. They will help you uh, in, in the backstage, right, with anything that uh, you might need if you have any problems. So I am going to start sharing my screen. And uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to read your uh, comments. But what I am going to do at the end of the session is to give you the opportunity of answering the question, uh, asking your questions, and I will be answering them at the end of the session, right? This happens uh, when you are doing two things at the same time, right? Start talking, and then you stop because you're clicking something. <laughs> So I hope, I do hope you were capable of watching my uh, PowerPoint presentation. And now this is the full screen, right? So we will be together for the next hour. And I will be talking a little bit about emotional intelligence. But I want to uh, talk about uh, some things first. Number one, thank you so very much. We had over 900, almost 1,000 registrations to this webinar. So we are so, so uh, uh, happy to have all this response from all of you, teachers from all over Brazil. And uh, I do want to uh, profit from this, sorry, this opportunity to thank Giselle for this opportunity and especially Lydica and, and Hiki for uh, all the support in using this app and also all the questions and difficulties that I had preparing for the this webinar. So thank you very much. And thank you for joining us. So again, this will be also streamed via Facebook. So if you have any problems or if you have friends trying to access uh, click meeting and not being able to, uh, send them to Facebook, okay? This recording, uh, I mean, this session is going to be recorded and later on it's going to be available on YouTube through Giselle channel. So if you miss something or if you don't have enough time to copy a link or a uh, suggestion, on bibliography, don't worry because you will be able to um, recap through the recording later on, okay? Another thing uh, that they asked me to talk about is uh, certificates. Uh, the ones who need or the ones who uh, expect to receive a certificate, you have to get in touch with us all later via email and they will email you the certificate right after the end of the session uh, throughout the ne throughout next week, okay? And we are going to finish the session at 4, but uh, at 5 p.m. you have Carla Xavier. She's another speaker. She's going to uh, give a presentation webinar on, uh, sorry, on assessment, uh, quizzes, questionnaires, evaluations, and uh, she's going to do that straight from London, right? So let's watch her presentation, her webinar at five. So all registrations also through uh, Giselle's link, okay? So I hope you all, you all can hear me. I'm gonna start my presentation. And the title, as you saw when you enrolled, is A Matter of Feeling emotional develop, uh, development in the language classroom. And I decided to use this image uh, for my presentation 
because we are human beings and uh, as human beings we have both sides of our brains or our brain and our heart and constant in struggle uh, for uh, not only understanding the world that surrounds us but also uh, to help us make our decisions right so before we start because I, I don't know about you, but I'm very, very anxious and I am very, very electric. So I need to calm down a little bit. So I want you to join me in this. Let's do some belly breathing. So I want you to put your hands on your belly and start, and start breathing in and out. In and out. In and out. Feel your belly moving, right? Becoming empty and full again. Empty and full. Empty and full. Empty and full. Keep on breathing, don't stop. But while you're breathing, I want you to look around your room. Have a look around the room. Notice five colors around you. Can you see them? Think carefully about the intensity and shade of the colors, perhaps naming them in your mind as you go. Your favorite colors, the colors that you can see in front of you. Now move your move into your body and find four things that you can feel. The clothing on your skin. You can feel the contact of your feet on the ground or the rise and fall of your body as you breathe in and out, in and out. Tune into the world of sound around you. Pay attention. Notice three things that you can hear. You can hear my voice. What else can you hear? Now I want you to use your sense of smell to notice two fragrances around you. Maybe it's the food that was uh, just cooked. Maybe it's the perfume that you are using. Now, finally, I want you to see what you can taste. What can you taste that is around you? Okay, now focus on your body again. Move your shoulders. Stretch your legs. Raise your hands up in the air and stretch. It feels good, doesn't it? <laughs> this is an activity that I took from an article from our blog, World of Better Learning, called Supporting Every Teacher, Three Mindfulness Tips for Teachers. This has to do with language, do you agree with me? But the main focus is to calm the people who are doing this activity, to have them have time to calm down, get, re uh, get rid of the stress, and focus on themselves, right? To stop paying attention to the things that uh, are around, not only people, things, everything. So you... Your mind gets ready and clean in order to be able to receive more information or to do something else or something next, right? So this is one of the activities that help us work with emotions in the classroom. When students are very, very um, uh, stressed or when they are kind of angry or when they are feeling uh, hot or cold, or if they are very, very anxious, an activity like this can calm them down and get them prepared for what you want to do next, right? And if they are too stressed or too 
uh, noisy, it's very difficult to call their attention. With an activity like this, you not only uh, you will not only be able to call their attention, but you will also be able to, let's say, get in the same uh, synchrony as they are, right? So you are going to build a bond doing this activity like we did, right? Now I can start. <laughs> so the agenda for today, I'm going to start with the session outs. It's a kind of short session today. So there are lots, thousands of things that I would be willing to talk about, but I won't have enough time. So there are certain things that I would like to talk about, but I will leave for another session, not for today, right? Then we are going to talk a little bit about definitions, emotions in the classroom. Then we are moving towards emotional development and emotional intelligence and we are going to draw some conclusions out of it. As I said, I won't be able to read your comments or your questions. So what I am going to do is at the end of the session, uh, we are going to have some minutes for questions or comments, right? And if uh, I won't, if I don't have enough time to answer all the comments or questions, I'm gonna leave you my email address and I want you to feel free to contact me later on, okay? So the session outs. I'm not going to talk about theory and approaches because time is very short. Uh, I'm not going to talk about humanistic education in authors, although this is something that possibly some of you are expecting. Although I am going really to talk about other aspects of teaching rather than content. I'm not going to approach brain research because this would take a long time as well. And I'm going to leave also positive psychology aside today. Although uh, I am going to maybe touch a little bit of each of these uh, items during my presentation. Okay, so ready to go? Okay, I'm going to start by the definition of emotion. Emotion, a strong feelings such as love and anger or strong feelings in general. This is from our Cambridge Advanced Learners Dictionary, right? Because it talks about feeling, I am going to, to give you a definition for feeling as well. So feeling can be a physical sense, like for example, when you feel something physical, I had a tingling feeling in my fingers. It can be also an emotion, a feeling of loneliness, for example, or a feeling of happiness that I'm feeling right now. <laughs> and also feelings in general. For example, I, well, I, I'm so sorry, I didn't want to hurt his feelings. Feelings in general, right? And that leads me to another word, another word uh, that is called effect. Effect is a verb, right? It can, uh, it can have the meaning of influencing. For example, the divorce affected every aspect of her life, for example. And affect in the sense of pretending. Uh, to all his problems, she affected indifference. So as a verb, uh, you pronounce it affect and of course, uh, the meanings are here. But there's another uh, word that is related to this spelling, which is a noun. And as a noun, we pronounce it affect. And in psychology, affect is the outward display of one's emotional state, is the way we react to something emotionally, right? So one can express feelings verbally, by talking about events with emotional word choices and tone. So through the way a person expresses uh, him or herself, we can see the level of affect in uh, this person. A person's affect also includes nonverbal communication, such as body language and gestures. Okay, now what about language teaching? Well, this is Arnold and Brown, right? J uh, Jane Arnold and Douglas Brown. Uh, they say, we consider that basically 
affect is related to aspects of emotion, feeling, mood, or attitude, which condition behavior. And this is something very interesting, right? Because uh, when we talk about emotion and feeling, uh, it's something that generally we feel within ourselves. And affect is something that is, uh, let's say, uh, can be seen or perceived out of us, right? Uh, in our behavior or the way we express ourselves, right? So this is from a book called Effect in uh, Language Learning. Okay, so isn't it true that we are always finding within ourselves mind and, and heart, our reason and our emotion in order to decide the best thing uh, to approach a problem or the best choice for a situation? And generally, uh, let's say, uh, five years uh, be behind us or a couple of years in the past, uh, generally the idea we had is that the heart should always lose, that uh, we have to have the reign of the brain over our heart, our emotion, right? But this is not quite true because we see them as um, opponents. We see them in different sides, and basically they are part of the same brain, right? So this is a comic uh, strip from Pickles, I mean, Brian Crane in Pickles. Uh, it's a retired couple, uh, Earl and Opal, and uh, they have differences in terms of uh, actions, uh, thinking, and especially actions, right? So uh, she says, a few years ago, some, uh, someone gave me a ceramic frog, and I told them I loved it. Well, big mistake. Okay, now, everyone gives me frog uh, gifts. Uh, they think I collect them. And, I mean, I like them okay, but uh, one would have been enough, right? And then he says, why don't you tell people you don't really like frogs? And then she says, oh, I don't want to hurt their feelings. I have other ways of handling it. Crash, boom. And says, oops, there goes another one. <laughs> so again, it, this is something very interesting because they think in different ways. And although she, uh, Opal thinks about her friends, she acts in a totally opposite di direction, right? So we can see different uh, influences on the decision that uh, uh, she takes to solve the problem. So basically, this is what happens when we are uh, thinking about how to deal with situations in everyday life. But we think about heart and brain as if they had the same size and the same way, and that is not true. They are heavy, and sometimes it's difficult to, to take uh, an emotional decision or a uh, reasonable, a rational decision. And in this case, we try to keep our balance, and it's not as easy as this picture shows. Sometimes it's difficult if we, to see if we're being led by our, our emotion or by our, our logic, right? And to be able to cope with all these elements and take the right decision requires not only uh, development of emotional skills, but also emotional intelligence, right? So what's the difference between emotional and rational, right? This is from Effect in Language Teaching by Jane Arnold. She says, in years of clinical ex and experimental work, he, the major, Antonio the major, he is a neuroscientist uh, and psychologist, professor of psychology. Uh, so he says, he said that uh, he has been able to observe how the absence of uh, emotion compromises our rational capacity. And that is true, right? He affirms that the uh, aspects of the uh, process of emotion and feeling are indispensable for rationality. So it's not really something totally different. Emotion and reason, they are part of the same brain, right? 
And uh, Jane continues by saying, it should be noted that the effective side of learning is not the opposition to the uh, cognitive side. It's not in the op opposition of the cognitive side. When both are used together, the learning process can be constructed on a firmer foundation. So we need our emotions as well our, as our reason, right? Neither the cognitive nor the affective has a less word, and indeed, neither can be separated from the other. So the idea it would be to join forces, to uh, consider not only uh, emotional aspects, but also logical and rational aspects of uh, the situation in order to come up with a conclusion. And then we create balance. And then we have only one brain. And um, eventually uh, what will happen is that uh, both sides will work so much together that we won't see what is reason and what is emotion because both of them will be totally, totally integrated. And that's the idea, right? Okay, fine. So let's see an example of that. So we saw how Opal uh, deals with the problems, right? Now let's see Ernst. Uh, his uh, grandson comes to him and said, Grandpa, uh, Grandma said, I'm like you, Grandpa. I don't have any common sense. Well, he uh, could get a very, very um, ups upset, angry, or sad, right? But he says, well, son, the word common means ordinary. Who wants to be ordinary? Uh, what, we, what we have is extraordinary sense, which is way better than common sense. <laughs> so he twists everything, right? And he says, finally says, if we had common sense, do, we, do you think we'd be eating chocolate donuts on grandma's nice sofa? Well, that for me is called payback. <laughs> so again, um, the way we deal with things or with uh, uh, situations or difficulties will depend a lot on the way we think or the way we reason and use our emotions at the same time, right? Um, to uh, psychologists, educators, Antonio de Maggio, he divided feelings in five different groups. And uh, all the other feelings will enter in each of these categories, right? The, the uh, five main categories. That was in 94. In 95, Daniel Goldman, the writer of Emotional Intelligence, a bestseller, in, in the area, he uh, divided feelings into eight different categories, and the other feelings will fit into this eight, right? If we have a look at these uh, emotions, okay, we all have had, um, let's say, a taste a little bit of each of them, and that happens to everybody. So why? Why do we talk about emotional development as if it were something special, right? It, it's part of everybody's feelings in everybody's minds, right? But again, one thing is to have all these feelings there. They are named, labeled, we can recognize them. But another thing is to see them in the in a language classroom. A lot more than in the classroom, in the language classroom, which makes it uh, even uh, more different than uh, feelings we have every day, right? Um, this is an article that uh, Jane Arnold wrote on effect. Uh, it's called Attention to Effect in Language Learning. She says, any classroom situation is influenced by the relationship between learning and affect, but uh, language learning in langu with language learning, this is especially crucial since our self-image is more vulnerable when we do not have, sorry, more vulnerable when we do not have mastery of our vehicle for expression, language. 
in another language, we can be who we are in our mother language, right? We can be so fun, we can be so talkative, we can be so charming or witty or uh, whoever we are, right? Because there is a language barrier in the, uh, let's say, higher the level, the better the self-expression will become in another language. But until it gets there, there is a space in time where the students is going, where the students are going to be trapped in the language, right? Without being able to use uh, language in order to express all his uh, or her feelings and emotions. And William says, there is no question that learning a foreign language is different to learning other subjects subject, sorry. This is mainly because of the social nature of such a venture. Language, after all, belongs to a person's whole social being. It's part of one's identity. And that leads me uh, to the learner identity. Imagine, I am a student, and then the teacher uh, asks me to stand up and talk about myself. And I am a basic level student. So I'm going to start. Wow. Uh, me, me, I, I, Teresa, named Teresa. Uh, I, uh, I house uh, Sao Paulo, uh, like movies, like uh, 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 music. Uh, uh, okay, that's it. And I sit down. When I sit down, the first thing I'm going to say, Wow, gee, how come I can be so stupid? Oh, I can't believe I did that, I said that. <laughs> wow, what? A... <laughs> really, I am so ashamed of what I just did. So again, as a student, we won't be able to say the, the, the things we say with our mother tongue. And because we can uh, achieve the level of... Uh, communication that we do in our own language, our identity as a learner is being shaped, right? Uh, so we are not going to be, uh, be so natural, so happy using another language, especially when our, we are starting to learn it. And because of that, different types of feeling will uh, appear, apart from anger, sadness, uh, shame, we are going to start feeling a uh, low level of self-esteem. Uh, maybe sadness in the sense of not being able to achieve a goal. We are going to start feeling incapable of uh, fulfilling uh, a task or a goal or an exercise, right? And because of that, we start to create self-defense mechanisms. And these mechanisms, uh, they uh, lead us to react in different ways. What different ways? Feeling helplessness. Well, you know, I hate English because I never, I'm never going to learn it. I have difficulties in speaking. I can't listen very well. It's too troublesome. You know, I don't have a way for languages. Something like this. And there's nothing the teacher can say or do. And the students too are going to feel that nobody or nothing can help them, right? Another uh, defense mechanism is the level of anxiety, suffering for everything before the test, before the class starts, before they are about to speak, right? Inhibition, and uh, inhibition in the sense of being afraid of uh, talking, shyness, but not only that, but to put him or herself aside in order to, uh, to avoid calling attention uh, to his or her presence, right? The lack of attention, lack of interest to participate, laziness, and say, okay, students, let's get our student box. And the student start thinks about his life, and then the exercise is almost um, done. And he still didn't get his student book, for example. It looks like laziness, though, right? And it can eventually lead to attitude problems in the classroom. And all this has to do with the emotional aspect of uh, 
the phase that student's specifically going through, right? So see how much that affects uh, the content, the learning of the content, which should be a lot more uh, logical or at least cognitive. So one thing is pretty much connected to the other. So we have positive and negative effect. Positive effect can provide invaluable support for learning, just as negative effect, effect can close down the mind and prevent learning from occurring altogether. And with this metaphor of the effective filter, Crashing, Stephen Crashing, warns about the problems created for learning by the negative aspect, but just as important as avoiding negative effective reactions is finding ways to establish a positive effective climate. Positive effect can lead to motivation and negative effect can lead to self-defense mechanisms. Um, simply put, this is a kind of summary, a general summary of what happens with emotions in the language classroom. So this is what we see. We enter the classroom and we see a, a student like this, or a student with a blunt face showing no emotion. But on the inside, they might be feeling like this, or like this, or like this, or even like this, but they just don't feel like showing their own emotions. So my uh, message to you would be, there is a voice that doesn't use words. Listen, right? And we do that by uh, giving room for positive effect, by lowering anxiety in the classroom, creating a low anxiety uh, atmosphere. Uh, this uh, activity that we just developed at the beginning of the session, the mindfulness is one uh, of the activities that we can do. But not only that, warm-ups in general, they lower anxiety in the classroom, right? Something that students can laugh uh, with, they can have fun, they can interact with other students. To offer opportunities uh, for learners to succeed, right? To create achievable goals for every single uh, exercise or task that you set out students for. Building confidence and self-esteem in the classroom. See the learner as a whole from a cognitive, emotional, and physical point of view, right? Because they are a human being, right? They are human beings. Uh, providing them with personalized ex uh, exercises with that, they will be able to express their feelings, their emotions, their opinions, and that will make their experience a lot more meaningful, right? And they will be able to remember and like their memories of uh, past exercises or uh, classes that they have watched in the past. That will lead eventually to learner autonomy, which is one of the most important things uh, to develop in a language classroom. One example, this is from Evolve, Evolve series level one, when we talk about apps for life. So students during the session, they are going to check their smartphones and have a look at the apps that they have installed, the ones that they use the most, how often they use it, and then they are going to exchange ideas with their uh, peers. Imagine your students talking about the apps they use in everyday life. Uh, it's amazing because no matter how many apps you have installed on your smartphone, there's always somebody who can talk about another one that you have never heard of, right? And it's amazing because when you are very, very enthusiastic about an app, you can talk for hours about it, right? So it this is a moment where students can be the master of the content because they know how to work with the apps. They know how to show it. They know all the tools within this app that can talk about it. And then language is going to be just a tool because the topic, uh, the content is uh, managed by the students. 
this gives a sense of uh, uh, achievement or of pleasure that no other type of activity can, uh, uh, let's say, top or even compare to this one, right? So giving students the opportunity to talk about things they like, things they know about is something very important and it works a lot on their emotional side as well. So all this has to do with report, the way they connect to one another, the way they exchange information, the way they build relationships within the classroom. So a lot more than talk and interact, we're talking about connections, right? We connect when we give a little bit of what we, uh, who we are, of what we think in the classroom, right? And then little by little, we will be able that things are not so hard to do. It's not so hard to write, it's not so hard to speak, it's not so hard to interact, right? And this is something that students have to find out for themselves, right? Imagine when we don't have this level of report. So this is a nice, nice puppy, adorable, and we are talking about anger management. And see if you agree with me. When angry with someone, it helps to sit down and think about the problem. Don't you agree? I totally agree. So looks at how this puppy sits on the problem. <laughs> Very, very nice, right? So again, this is something very, very interesting because uh, the more we think before we act, the more we uh, reason upon our emotions, uh, better solutions will, will come out of this, out of this. Now, the opposite is also true. So this is a quote from Daniel Goleman in Emotional Intelligence. He says, if your emotional abilities are in, in hand, if you don't have self-awareness, if you're not able to manage your distressing emotions, if you can have empathy and have effective relationships, then no matter how smart you are, you are not going to get very far. And uh, basically, this is why we consider emotional development as one of the key skills for the future. Right? Again, emotional development. Emotional development is being aware of a wide range of, range of emotions and developing an ability to apply this emotional knowledge in challenging situations as a coping strategy. And uh, not only that, but we use our emotions, we use the knowledge, the knowledge we have upon somebody else's emotions in order to guide our actions as well. And this is being emotionally intelligent, right? Your thoughts affect your emotions. Your emotions affect your decisions. And your decisions affect your life. That's why emotional development is part of what we call a set of skills for life, right? And if, we, if students learn how to be emotionally intelligent during their school uh, life, chances are they will carry all this through their adult life as well. Right? We talk a lot about competency. And when we talk about, co about competency, we think about knowledge, isn't it? And this is what we work with uh, when we teach students in... Um, in recent years, the more we work, the more emphasis on skills we are uh, having, right? Not only on the forming skills, listening, reading, uh, listen, speaking, reading, and writing, but also on other skills that support them in for. For example, the critical thinking skills, which are, uh, let's say, uh, one of the four C's of the 21st century skills, right? But there's another thing that is as important as this too, which is attitude. Attitudes that can control and determine the level of knowledge students will be able to acquire and of course, uh, the level of development of their skills. And attitudes, they are totally, totally related to emotion. And because of that, 
working with the emotional uh, side of uh, students learning is working on their competencies as well, right? Something to keep in mind. Recent psychological studies have shown that a developed emotional competence favors both our social adaptation and resolution of conflicts, but also improves our academic performance, our ability to make decisions, and our well being. We will feel better if we are able to reason or cope with our own emotions. So, if it is good for us, imagine for the students, right? Uh, this is from Isamitiba, who says, there is no happiness that is ready-made, that happiness can be found in every step of the way towards achievement. Basically, this is what language teaching is all about. So uh, it's not, uh, emotional development is not something that we're going to say, now let's stop working with language and now let's work on our emotions. Well, that does not happen. We work with emotional development while we are working on language, while we are working on development of skills in general, right? So when we work with stories, for example, we are exposing students to different situations that can uh, understand, recognize, and uh, especially see what's good and what is not good. They can take good examples and they can build values and morals for the story. This can change the way they think and the way they act, right? Songs and chants, they provide students with a social experience, uh, the opportunity to uh, enjoy something together with the other students to have a social experience that allows them to feel they are part of uh, a group, the, to foster this feeling of belongingness that is very important. Generally, students who do not fit in the group, they tend to quit because they don't feel uh, welcome in the group. Now, the opposite is also true. Some students who have difficulties, they don't quit because of the group, because they love the class uh, so much they would never quit, right? So uh, songs and chants are very, very nice opportunities for that. Not, all, not to mention that they decrease the level of anxiety for speaking practice, for oral practice, right? Games, because games, apart from working on language, structure, etc., it helps the students cope with pressure and also with failure when that happens, right? If we talk about problem-solving activities, of course we apply critical thinking skills, but we also work on concentration and students' resilience. Because some students, when things start getting uh, a little difficult, they tend to quit. So when we work with problem-solving activities, we are teaching our students to think, to concentrate, to focus, and to endure difficulties in order to overcome possible problems or difficulties, right? Role plays, with role plays, we use or create students' empathy. Is the opportunity of having students uh, place themselves in somebody else, uh, else's shoes, which is something very, very important. So when you say something, how would the person feel if you were that person, right? Projects. So they will learn, among other things, to work with conflict and uh, discussing using arguments to overcome differences. And this is something very important. If they don't learn it at school, chances are they will uh, grow up to be dissatisfied adults with disruptive behavior, right? And I think that uh, each of us, we know people like that, right? And it's sad because they, they uh, haven't developed the skills that were necessary when they were younger. And the older you are, the harder it is to do that, right? So the benefits of emotional intelligence, you create empathy in order to understand others. You um, develop the sense of respect tolerance, that reduces conflict, 
that improves your performance, leads you to responsibility, resilience, confidence, which is very, very important in language learning. It improves social skills and leads to autonomy. And apart from all this, it provides long-term success, which is one of the things that we expect or wish the most for our students. Right? This is an activity from Andesa Lago from an article in the in our blog, World of Better Learning blog, called Read, Write, and Draw. I'm just gonna very briefly describe the activity because we won't be able to do it. So she gives divides she divides the students into groups of three and she gives a short text to every group, different uh, short stories for every group, um, paragraphs really. So they read and every student assigns a sentence to another student and they have to draw it. So for example, Peter is climbing the acai palm tree. The uh, other student, which is student, um, student C, he draws uh, the scene. So they keep uh, taking turns drawing the sentences. And once the activity is over, they use these drawings to retell the story to the other groups, right? And eventually, they will be able to get to know every group story through the pictures. What interests me in this uh, activity is the result. So the results are, according to Andresa, I noticed that my students were self-confident by the end of the task because they were able to accomplish it by writing and speaking in English successfully. So see, this pretty much connected not only to the content, but to the feeling it caused, right? I believe that happened because first of all, they started the task in a small group and they then moved on to sharing the whole class. So see, she was building their confidence little by little. Another positive aspect of, uh, of it is that my students are not afraid to make mistakes because they feel comfortable within the group. And now mistakes are part of their learning process. And this is the key information I wanted to use in order to uh, teach them how to cope with their emotions. We need to make them uh, turn mistakes into learning objectives. So they plan on how to do an activity. They do it. After that, they review it. And then they make the necessary changes and do the same thing again. If I uh, do an activity and I make mistake, uh, make a mistake, and I never do it again, what will I learn from that? So I have to redo it. I have to use the mistake I made in order to improve my skills, to improve my the knowledge of the content I'm working on. And this is something that we can uh, little by little show to our students, and that will make a change, right? The way they think is something very, very important. I won't tell the story, but this is Green Man, one of our characters from a pre-primary level course book. And um, he, uh, Green Man is the protector of the forest and he lives in the forest, of course. And he, Nico is his friend. And Nico uh, shows Green Man around uh, showing different families with kids, um, father, mother, grandpa, grandma, etc. And he says, but what about you? Have you got a family? Says Nico. Yes, I have, says Green Man. The forest is my family. The animals are my friends. And Nico says, it's a big family. And says, yes, and we all look different. So see the underlying message? We are different, but it doesn't matter because although we are different, we are the same. In differences, they are not something bad. They are something that will enrich our everyday life. So in an indirect way, we are, we are fostering empathy and tolerance. And through those characters or those situations, uh, students will learn uh, different types of, uh, of values that will help them understand and cope with the world. world values. 
Values are what we need to guide us through life, to inform the way in which we interact with others. Parents, teachers, schools, and societies, they have an obligation to convey positive values to the next generation. But telling teens how they should or should not behave is rarely the most effective way of getting the message across to them. This is from Using Role Models to Promote Values in the Teen Classroom is one of the articles in our blog, World, World of Better Learning. So what does she recommend then? Uh, role models, right? So again, you should do this, you should do that. So Joan Rice says, the ability to get things done in a big company is much more a function of your ability to influence than it is about command and control. Do you agree that that happens also in the classroom? Students are not doing things because you uh, order that. They are doing it because you are asking for that right? Or you are guiding them to do them, right? So basically, it's a matter a lot more of leadership, right, than anything else. So the author, Laura, she, she uh, suggests role models. So imagine Obama, everybody knows, right? This is Daniel Gias, one of the most, or I think the most decorated Paralympian athlete. Just in Rio, he won four gold medals apart from the others. I think that altogether he got around seven to eight medals in the Olympic Games in Rio, right? And this is Malala, right? Malala is a Pakistan activist who uh, was shot because she wanted to study. I think everybody knows her story, right? So we can use uh, them as role models and act ask students to talk about them. I am inspired by X because, or I look up to X because of this or that. Or you can do the opposite. You can show, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, pictures of famous people that might not have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, common agreement in the classroom. For example, the Pope. Some people who are not Catholic might dis, uh, disagree that he is a good role model. Uh, if you talk about uh, Greta Thunberg, we have people who love her and we have people who hate her. <laughs> and Cristiano Ronaldo, a very, very wealthy, good looking and very, very um, uh, good athlete. But what if people do not agree uh, or see them as role models? So I can say, well, actually, I do not see X as a role model because they can't express their own feelings. And they will talk about the way these people act or react in, in real life, right? The, the way they think, the way they reason, their actions, right? And something that is very important, most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. So when we have discussion activities, one of the most important things is to have them or teach them to listen, to really listen. And to do that, for example, if we're talking about music, favorite movies, favorite role models, I may disagree with you, but that does not mean that I'm wrong or that you are wrong, right? They're just different types uh, of opinion, sides of uh, the same coin, right? So we have to teach our students to speak without offending and listen without defending. And then they will stop and really listen to what the others uh, have to say, right? So success depends less on materials, techniques, and linguistic analysis, and more on what goes inside and between the people in the classrooms. This is from Earl Stavik, right? So what about humor? Look, minions, I love minions. And uh, look, when you're stressed, you eat ice cream, cake, chocolate, and sweets. Why? I'm going to tell you why, because I totally agree. Because stress is spelled backwards, it's desserts. <laughs> 
totally illogical, but for me, it makes sense, okay? <laughs> and that's it. So having humor in the classroom is something very, very, very important. Because laughing, uh, it uh, gets us all together on the same page. And we are having fun together on the same thing, right? Well, time is getting short, so I have to uh, skip some things. Do you agree? Students who are loved at home come to school to learn. Schools who aren't, they come to school to be loved. This is from an educator, Nicholas Ferroni, right? Well, you may agree or disagree, but the uh, truth is, we have the critical thinking pyramid, the Bloom's taxonomy for critical thinking, right? But I'm gonna show you now the Maslow's pyramid of needs. Maslow, Abraham Maslow's, as uh, Maslow is uh, an American psychologist, and he uses this pyramid to define uh, human needs, right? And he says that we have basic needs uh, in different types of uh, levels, right? And uh, in order to be able to cope with um, the stress of, of our life and the things we have to do and the life we live, we have to try to fulfill these needs in order to be able to do what we want or what we uh, have to for our lives, right? So in terms of basic need, and this is related to the classroom uh, reality, because if not, uh, if they, these needs are not fulfilled, they might impact on students' learning as well. So in terms of basic needs, we are talking about physiological needs needs for food, rest, water, and uh, safety needs. The need to feel safe, to feel welcome in a group, right? Then we move to psychological needs. The feeling of belongingness, uh, the, feeling, the need to build uh, relationships, to make friends, to be loved. Steam needs, the prestige and the feeling of accomplishment that is also very important. And eventually, the self-fulfillment needs, the, the feeling that you are capable, that you have potential, that you can use your potential to achieve something. So these needs, they are as important as the critical thinking uh, skills to be developed because throughout the fulfillment of these needs, we will, uh, let's say, empower students to do what we want them to do, what we know they are capable of doing. And for that, apart from a uh, uh, content syllabus, we work on an emotional syllabus. There are some books that even bring this emotional syllabus embedded in their books. And now with our Cambridge Life Skills Framework, we are more and more including these skills throughout the development of, the, of our books. This is an example of a pre-primary level, and this is THINK for low upper secondary students, right? Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. This is from Roosevelt. And if students know that you care, that you believe they can achieve success, they will believe it too. So they, uh, they will trust you more than they trust themselves. And this is something very, very, important. I'm going to show you now, I'm going to stop uh, sharing this uh, presentation because I am not going, this is not the end of the presentation, but I want you to, I want to show you a video that summarizes everything that we have been doing so far. It's a moving, moving um, ad I received during Christmas talking about friendship. Have a look. So this life is given everyone a present Beautiful, shiny and new Everyone but you Golden ribbons, diamonds line everyone's path that leads to wide open doors Everyone's but you Wide open doors Hold on Keep on Even when the road seems very long Ooh. Open your eyes Even if it's cold 
because they put themselves in there and he shoes as well, right? So it talks about tolerance, respect, and everything we have been talking about today. And it's interesting because it shows how important emotions are in relationships, in groups, and especially in what happens in the classroom as well, right? Emotional intelligent uh, uh, students uh, are happier because emotional intelligence allow, allows the students to manage emotions, set positive goals, feel empathy for others, maintain positive relationships, and make responsible decisions, right? Something to keep in mind, it takes more than intelligence to act intelligently. This is from Dostoevsky, and now we know uh, what, right? What it takes. Okay. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I am kind of five minutes late, but um, I don't know if this is going to allow me uh, an extra five minutes to to answer questions, but I am going to leave you my email address. So if there's something that you would like to ask me later, you can contact me. But before I do, I want you to um, write down two suggestions. One is called Affect in Language Learning by Jane Arnold. And then we have another one from Jane Arder, Arnold and Tim Murphy called Meaningful Action. These are the main uh, uh, books that I use for reference, apart from the articles from our Better Learning blog, right? And uh, there is a booklet on emotional development that is available for download for free in our site. So you can download only the emotional development booklet, or you can download the whole series, the Cambridge Framework uh, for, for Life Skills. We have eight booklets altogether, each of them talking about one aspect of life skills, critical thinking, um, collaboration, communication, etc. Where? In our blog. So cambridge.org slash Cambridge English, you click on blog and you can find all of this. Or you can click life skills or you can click emotional development, you're going to be directed to the download page, right? Just for you to know, all the articles I use from our blog called World of Better Learning Blog, Wobble. And nowadays we are posting a lot of articles uh, to support our teachers working at home, teaching online. So just for you to have some examples, we have, I don't know, we have thousands of articles, plus the new ones that are being posted just for this moment of crisis. So access. Uh, share it, and please use all the tools that we are, uh, um, let's say, putting available for you to uh, help you through this uh, phase, right, until things go back to normal, and they will eventually, right? So, unfortunately, I won't be able, oh, maybe I will. <laughs> So just as a nice uh, final activity, I know times are hard. So if you think about this past couple of weeks, I want you to think one, two, three, or three, two, one, three. Think of three new things you have learned how to do these days. One, two, three. Now think of two nice things you were able to do for somebody else. One, two. And now think of one good lesson you have learned these days. A nice lesson. So see things are, are going uh, well so far, so far so good. It doesn't matter what comes ahead of us, we will make it. So stay strong, stay safe, and I'm gonna to ask, I'm gonna ask you for a last favor. This uh, is a presentation called A Matter of Feeling. My name is Teresa Sequia, 
and I would love you to uh, fill the feedback form. It's very short. You can use your QR code reader, access the link. Uh, probably Enrique is uh, placing the link. Uh, if you're watching this presentation uh, on the recording later on, um, probably the, the link is not going to be available anymore. It's just for the ones who are attending the session now uh, via click meeting or Facebook, okay? So there's there are no words for me to say how much I thank you. This is my email address. And please, if you have any comments, any questions, feel free to contact me, right? Thank you very much. Uh, Enrique, I don't think you're going to allow me for further questions, right? So I'm going to ask you to email me. And please keep in mind that at 5 o'clock, we have another session, uh, another webinar. Uh, and um, for that, you have to access the link. Possibly, Enrique is also showing you the link for the, um, for the meeting at five o'clock on evaluation questionnaires, right? And let, keep up the good work. Thank you so very much for the session. And let's keep on building bridges together for our future and for our students' future. Thank you so very much. What do you think, Enrique? Do I have any minutes uh, for questions or you don't think so? You can answer by WhatsApp if necessary. No, hold on just a second. Here. Well, I think time is up, right? Oh, the certificate. The certificate, you can uh, email Giselle. And uh, after emailing Giselle, they will send you the certificate later on. Well, now I'm able to see your comments. Thank you very much. Wow, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> wow, yes. <laughs> well, um, uh, doing webinars is not as good at uh, um, doing uh, events or presentations in presence personally, right? But it was really wonderful to be here with you. And don't forget, uh, my email address is available, right? So keep in touch if you need anything. It was really, really a pleasure. And uh, I hope you have enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you so very much. <laughs> Thank you. Hope to see you again in, an, in our next event or next webinar, okay? Bye-bye.